Start comes. All right, everybody, welcome back to Las Vegas. We're here at the MGM Grand Hotel. This is UiPath Forward. This is the sixth year that the Cube, sixth year in a row that the Cube has done Forward. We only missed the first one, which was a small technical meetup in New York City, but we've been documenting the journey of UiPath from RPA specialist into hyper automation, and now Agentic is the buzzword. Everybody's talking about it no matter where you go. Whatever conference, it's not only AI and Gen AI, it's also agents and Agentic. And you know, we're here to talk about what's actually real, what that journey looks like, what we can expect in the future. I'm really excited to have Ted Shelton here as the Chief Operating Officer of Inflection AI. We're joined by two guests from Intel. Marty Finkelstein is the Chief Information Officer at Intel. Big job, and Kyle Short as well at Intel, who's responsible for operationalizing a lot of this machine intelligence. Gentlemen, Thanks so much for coming on theCUBE, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Ted, let's start with you. Um, the company has uh, been through a really interesting transformation lately, Inflection AI, in the early days here of, of Gen AI. You guys have, you use the term refounded, uh, and now you're focusing heavily on the enterprise, uh, which is, I love that. You know, a lot of innovation comes out of the consumer markets, as we know, but we, we are B2B people, we love enterprise, so we love to go deep, and you're really focusing on helping organizations get to their proprietary data, and Intel is an example of, an early example where you're testing some of these concepts out. So tell us about the, the partnership with, in, well, first of all, what's new with Inflection? What about the partnership with Intel that we need to know? Sure, well, um, you're absolutely right. We started out focused on consumers, uh, and our Pi uh, uh, application, Pi.ai, or Pi on your iPhone or Android phone, uh, has been used by tens of millions of people. We've learned an enormous amount by running uh, large scale um, uh, consumer uh, AI. Um, and since March, we've been focused on pivoting to the enterprise. Um, and we've thought about a few things, uh, and we've talked to a lot of companies about what their needs are. Um, and Number one, what we heard was that there's a lot of dissatisfaction with the way in which the um, current commercial models are available for using automation uh, and AI together uh, because you have to go to the model provider. The, the model providers are in the hyperscalers and you take your data to the model provider and trust the model provider and it becomes very unwieldy. And so we started looking around for a partner uh, who was trusted by the enterprise uh, who had an AI accelerator that we could use with our models, uh, who would, we would be able to walk into the enterprise with together and say, we have an opportunity for you to run your own AI. Instead of you bringing the data to the model provider, we'll bring the model to you, you keep your data. Uh, and so that was, uh, that was the genesis of this, uh, this partnership. So Marty, it's, I said, big job that you have. I actually, uh, one of your colleagues sent me the report that you do, your annual report, wow. Really impressive. I wish I knew about this 20 years ago. It was so it's great information in there. Now I know it's early days for you guys, um, and and you're testing some th some things out. But for those who may not be familiar with, so first of all, why is this an interesting opportunity for you? Um, and what's your vision here? So so let's talk a little bit about the partnership and what's actually happening there, right? Right. So inflection is running in our Intel Tiber AI cloud, testing our Gaudi 2 and now Gaudi 3 accelerators, which is, you know, I'm told they're incredibly promising, but, but the proof is going to be when we finish a lot of this testing. And, and also, let's go back to some of the basics. What do we care about? We care about the model. The model has to be a great model. We care about the data. And the data is incredibly important to the enterprise. We have to make sure that privacy rules are adhered to. We have to make sure security rules are adhered to. And many enterprises like to have their data, you know, depending on the classification, not leave its premises. So we are testing, you know, on Inflection AI, we're testing what are the use cases, what are the models, how can we leverage an LLM with data that we would like to have on-prem because it may be customer data, it may be IP data, it may be various data that we would like to have the best, but on-prem. So you guys make actually a really interesting uh, example because first of all, you're a large global organization 
you've got you know, manufacturing operations, you've got a lot of data all over the place, and you're hybrid. I mean, you've got, you've got the Intel cloud, you've got all, all kinds of data on-prem through, throughout the organization. You've been around for decades. Um, so, you know, you've got a lot of battle scars, you've got a lot of experience, and so all that makes for a, a very challenging environment, doesn't it? So if you, it's like in New York, if you can succeed there, you succeed anywhere. And, yeah. and as you know, with our latest announcements, we have Intel Foundry, so that's the manufacturing arm, where we want to make sure the data is on-prem and close to the factories, and we get you know, the best and the brightest capabilities there, and we have the Intel product, which has different you know, needs when it comes to, to compute and, and things. So we are actually <laughs> focused in AI, on very large and very potentially, I'm going to say, game-changing items. Manufacturing, design, as well as software development. So you look after Foundry as well, both for the integrated Foundry as well as the sort of um, the new business. Is that right or is that under your... So, so IT, so we're, what we have is global IT. We support the entire corporation. We're part of the Intel corporate structure, and we support both sides. And there are teams that support specifically the technology within the factory because we do have technology within the factory. It's interesting. Um, a lot of companies will spend, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten plus percent of their revenue on IT. In your report, it was about two or 2.1 percent. So extremely efficient use of IT. Hock Tan would be proud of you. And, oh, yeah. Kyle, you know what I'm talking about, right? Hawk's very, very proud of how little he spends on IT uh, as a percentage of revenue. Yep. But, but um, obviously, you're having some success there, Kyle. I want to ask you: When I talk to security practitioners about the NIST framework, they always say, "Okay, that NIST framework is is something that's super important." Um, and you're probably wondering where I'm going with this question, but they tell me it's very hard to operationalize. I would imagine it's similar for an organization like Intel, because everybody wants to throw use cases out there. Hey, let's try this. Um, mine is the one like Horshack and that show. Ooh, ooh pick, on, pick me, pick me. Um, but you've got to prioritize, and you've got to figure out where you're going to get the most business value, and there's individual, Productivity. There's team productivity, but then there's organizational value. Um, it's really the sexy, shiny new toy. How do you operationalize machine intelligence generally, and, and AI and Gen AI specifically, and automation? What are you finding is working? Yeah, it's a it's certainly a blended model. I mean, it, it's a combination of technology and operating model. So there is a long tail of opportunity that as you noted, everyone has these ideas and you want to enable a cycle of innovation. You want everyone to have the opportunity to explore the use of generative AI and automation together to help unlock potential value. But in the long tail, the individual opportunities, the value of those opportunities is relatively small. In the aggregate, it's potentially significant. And what we're seeing is um, the workforce moving to a place where that digital upskilling is critical. And we think that there is a productivity uplift in the long tail, but the way you approach it is through democratization. You have to empower them to be their own AI innovators. But for those, those truly game-changing um, processes that Mahdi had referred to, that have the potential to really improve your OPEX position, to improve your top line revenue, and um, you know, at the end of the day, affect your EBITDA, you really need to take a more structured, measured approach. And that means you have to take a bird's eye view of the company. You have to be able to um, centralize the deployment of your resources to those initiatives that have demonstrable ROI. And so really it's a two-pronged approach uh, where you have uh, you know, a, a centralized program uh, tackling the head of that long tail, and then you have a democratized uh, technology supported program offered to your employees to uplift them and, and drive productivity there. You know, we were looking at the, some productivity. We had a conversation earlier today on productivity and I pulled up some Bloomberg stats, like a you know hundred year view of productivity, and and there weren't a lot of eras where you saw sustained productivity growth, fifties and sixties because the consumer wave, and you guys remember well because Intel it was your fault in a good way, um, the the microprocessor revolution, the PC revolution created a really a decade long productivity boom as we all got PCs. You all, we all I think are old enough to remember that. 
we used to never have PCs. We had like, for me, it was a Wang terminal. You know, you'd, 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 you'd have these, you know, removable disks. But then everybody got a PC, and we had this law in lo local area networks, long sustained productivity. We haven't seen anything like that. We've seen bounces when you had like the 2007, 2008, you know, crash. Uh, COVID was a little spike because everybody was spending like crazy just to stay in, in business. But so, a lot of us believe that we are entering a new era of, of productivity, and maybe this will be your fault, Ted, because you're now in the third, I think the third generation of, of, of inflection, inflection 3.0. Um, you began, I think, by training on you know, every bit of data that was public with the internet, but now you're focused on really trying to find unique value. So maybe you could tell us about 3.0, and, and, and how potentially you're applying it in organizations like Intel and perhaps others. Sure. Uh, well, Inflection 3.0 we announced two weeks ago, um, and uh, a couple of really important things about uh, that. Uh, it's not just a model. Uh, so yes, there is a model, but it is actually a full AI system which has 23 different components, which is very important to the enterprise because uh, just having a model doesn't give you what you need to really do complex applications in an enterprise context. Uh, so one of, obviously one of the really important things we did is we moved off of uh, uh, NVIDIA. Everything was developed originally in NVIDIA and used the CUDA framework, um, which is an accelerator library to make use of the NVIDIA chips. And we said, no, we're going we're gonna to actually allow our customers to have choice uh, we're going to give them the opportunity to work with an, a vendor that they trust already, Intel. Uh, and so we rewrote uh, all the acceleration of our um, product to be able to work on the Gaudi 2 and Gaudi 3 AI accelerators uh, using PyTorch and using Habana. Um, and so that was a, that was a big uh, initiative there. Uh, we also expanded the Agentic framework to be able to include our partner UiPath uh, so that right from the conversational interface, uh, employees can trigger AI, uh, from AI, the uh, UiPath automations. So that's another big uh, change in the way that system works. Um, and then the third element has to do with the way that we do tuning. Um, because I think the, uh, one of the important um, beliefs that we have is that because uh, uh, these technologies are going to be so central to the way that companies run and the way that work gets done in the everyday life of their employees, they need to be customized to a company. Um, you know, an Intel AI needs to truly be an Intel AI. Uh, it needs to actually know that it works for Intel. Uh, it needs to know the history of Intel and who the officers are and what the locations are and the secret language. Uh, you know, everybody's, every company's got their acronyms. You know, how many ARs did you take from the MRC? Um, <laughs> these guys know what I'm talking about. I've been picking it up <laughs> as we've been working together. Um, but, and that's the thing, it's like how do employees pick it up? How does your AI pick it up? So, uh, so that's the other really important element. Uh, you know, we spend a lot of energy uh, with our consumer application and learning how to do a great job of tuning the AI, and uh, and so that's exactly what we're doing now for the enterprise. So interesting, Marty. This puts a little pressure on you, right? Going going all in on on the Intel piece of it with well, maybe not all in, but leaning in um, to the Intel uh, uh, GPUs and and AI class systems, you lay out in your IT you know, APR report, your annual report, some key initiatives that you're focused on. I'm, I'm curious as to how you think about your portfolio. This, I think, falls in, into the, I don't know, early days, you know, er, of, of pioneering, maybe, ex maybe even experimental phase. You've got to kind of run the business, grow the business, transform the business. Maybe I could put in those three categories. It's not a bad way to look at it. And you got to decide, okay, how much do I spend on each and what's my return on each and what's my risk? And I don't know if you look at, look at the business that way. Uh, two questions, how do you sort of think about this partnership in that simple rubric that I just laid out? And how do you maintain you know, best of breed and best in class for your your constituents. Boy, so that, that's definitely a multi-part question. So, so let, me try <laughs> part, let, 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 let me try to parse this out a little. One, we can all agree that context matters, understanding the language, as well as understanding the history and the information that a company has is incredibly important to get the right results. Since Intel, for certain parts of its data, I mean, while I may use it in Intel Tiber AI Cloud, I'm not going to take it outside of my premises. And then we created very specific security capabilities within our cloud. 
the components that we need to do, and it's almost like let's change the wheels while we're driving uphill all at the same time. Yes, you have to account for all of this, and you have to account for the business value in various respects of where the value is. You know, there is value that's creating more revenue because you're designing new things. You're optimizing your manufacturing. You're optimizing your design. There is value because now I can do more with the same or maybe even less. There is value in savings and just costing less certain things. So all of those items are taken into account. You know, IT in essence is, is a business. It's a business unit. And it's a business unit that partners with all the other business units at Intel to achieve great products for the product side and the most optimal manufacturing for the manufacturing side. We are taking all of those items together, leveraging Intel on Intel capabilities to make sure that we have the best results and we achieve the savings, the cost avoidance, and the increased revenue and the increased capabilities faster for our customers in a very secure, secure way, making sure that data privacy is you know, adhered to and every legal aspect is adhered to as well. We took the approach of talking to all the business units, seeing what they cared about the most. So we have a portfolio of everything they want to use AI and they want to automate and they want to leverage. But we still picked on the main pillars I discussed before, manufacturing. Where is the biggest benefit that can happen? In design, pre and post silicon, where are the biggest benefits and what are the synergies that we can create, as well as in the software development. Believe it or not, Intel has a tremendous number of software developers. Yeah. So yes, we are changing, and what you also are seeing now, and I'm sure you, everyone is seeing this, the rapid acceleration of AI and the capabilities, this is not changes of you know what you saw a decade or two ago that things progressed and took you know people were talking about 10 years 15 years you're seeing this acceleration happen much much more rapidly so the the acceleration out of the technology world is happening faster but Kyle i would argue that adoption is still runs into humans process organizational structures so sort of coming back to you, what, what, what should our expectations be in terms of, even though, as Marty said, the innovations are coming fast and furious, you can't even keep up with um, the LLM du jour and the announcement you know, cadence, but what can we expect in terms of adoption within organizations? Yeah, I think that uh, depends on how big your vision is and your imagination. Go big or go home. Go big or go home. The reality is that, as Mahdi said, the technology is advancing very, very fast. And we're uncovering new opportunities even before productionalizing things. We're taking things through POC and then realizing we need to take a different path and restart the POC because there's new capabilities that were just released that, that kind of changed the game that existed the month before. So on one hand, this is really an old story. There's really nothing new about generative AI in the sense that um, automation is a business outcome, right? And all that generative AI is doing is widening the aperture of what is automatable in our processes. But it is the speed with which we are breaking down those barriers and opening new doors that I think um, we're about to see the enterprise landscape fundamentally change and in some ways become even unrecognizable in the not too distant future. Yeah, you know, I'm going to give some kudos to Kyle. So I had a you know, I would love to see something happen. And we, we actually, I believe we're getting an award for it tomorrow, but um, he goes, you know, that's interesting. And it actually happened. So sometimes that vision and the, I would love to see, and here is where I would like to be, it's becoming a reality. All right, so let's take that, Ted, that, that notion that Marty just put forth, that vision. What is realistic? Uh, in, in thinking about how LLMs, for example, can be can supercharge uh, an automation platform like UiPath, what should we expect? What kind of capabilities are achievable in the near and midterm? Yeah, well, I think 
it's no mystery to anybody watching this show that the enterprise IT uh, landscape, you know, all the challenges that you face in your everyday work has become a nightmare, right? Um, you know, I, one of the figures that was put on the, uh, the screen today during the keynote was that the average enterprise has 174 uh, enterprise applications. I wish. Um, and uh, <laughs> yeah, no, an organization like yours has so many more even. Now, not every employee uses every single one of those every day, um, but we all use too many. Um, and we know from the automation world that one of the other challenges is that we have to use many different ones to get a, a particular workflow done. So I'm taking information from one and I'm putting it into another and then I'm moving to a third to track it and you know, um, that complexity is a productivity killer. Um, and what I believe is that this technology connecting AI and automation together actually gives us an opportunity to move beyond the GUI era, which feels a little weird to me because like I was one of those guys, like you I'm sure, uh, uh, you know, you guys, we all grew up going, oh, let's get rid of the command line. Let's have a GUI. And now I'm kind of like, wait, actually if the command line's conversational, maybe I want the command line. Right, because if I can have a natural language conversation with my computing systems, I don't need the windows and the forms and the tabs and the, and the, the clicks, all, these, all, all this stuff that's going on in all these different interfaces. So I really see a future where our employees are having conversations with their information and conversations with their workflows and where we can put a conversational interface on top of those 174 different applications so that there is a natural free-flowing way that the AI becomes a true co-worker uh, for employees. So that, that's the future I envision. And uh, I, I think though the nice thing in this conversation is it's not just the conversation, which is a natural conversation, it's also the ability of who you're having that conversation with to actually know so much because it has access to all that data and to all the applications and to see what's going on. And this will mature in time. It's interesting, I was having a conversation with Daniel Denae, CEO of UiPath earlier, and, and I asked him about the name. I'm like, the UI is going to change, isn't it? Is it just as you just said? And he said, it's, it's, not, a, it's not an or. It's going to be an and. He said, we're still observing CLIs. And so, like, yeah, that's a good point. And so, that just makes it sort of more interesting and, and frankly, more complicated. But Kyle, I wonder, in thinking about uh, your experience in this, this area, how do you think about organizing a team? What kind of skills uh, do, you, do you look for? How has that evolved in the last couple of, of years with the sort of AI that you know, woke up the world? Yeah, so inside Intel, we actually have a very mature automation team uh, that, have, that has been deploying classic automation, I'll call it. By classic, I mean 18 months old at this point. <laughs> um, and we've got hundreds and hundreds, well over 700 automations deployed across the enterprise. And so what we've done is we've actually upskilled that team to become our generative AI team as well. And one of the, beauty, the beauties of generative AI is that it is actually unlocking access to AI and machine learning to different personas. So you, you no longer have to be a statistician or a data scientist to deploy generative AI, to build it, yes, but not to deploy it within the enterprise context. It's a software developer, it's an automation developer that now deploys this in the enterprise context. And because uh, the application of generative AI is really just an extension of automation, the process of identifying opportunities to automate is really an extension of business process re-engineering, Lean and Six Sigma style exercises. You're looking for waste in the work and you are applying software technologists to go address that waste. So you need to build a team with business analysis acumen, with software engineering acumen, you need the transition change management for sure, because we're entering a different era of work. And then of course your typical uh, program and project management. And all of those functions have to be um, re-educated in the context of what is possible with generative AI. Because we've all been taught about the cognitive barrier and what you cannot do with software, but that barrier has now fallen. And what you can do with software is an evolving uh, landscape constantly. And so that same workforce, while their underlying skill sets are the same, they have to reimagine their role in the context of a new technology paradigm. And that's interesting. It brings us kind of full circle into the productivity boom that I'm sort of hopeful that we'll see. Um, that kind of 
you know, a tailwind could help deal with debt, could help the AI uh, renaissance, could help deal with climate, with crime, poverty. I mean, we lay out these wonderful nirvana scenarios, but, um, but I'm hopeful, gentlemen. I could go on forever with you guys. A fantastic panel. Thank you so much for coming on theCUBE. Really thank appreciate you. It. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Okay, thank you for watching. Keep it right there. This is day one, Dave Vellante with Rebecca Knight. We're here at theCUBE covering wall-to-wall -wall UiPath Forward 2024. We'll be right back for this short break.